Song number 453 will be our song of invitation after the lesson this morning. We'll sing the first and first and third verse at that time. When we let the Bible speak to us instead of letting the mind of mere men do the talking, we will often come to realize the vast amount of religious false doctrine that surrounds us in our world today. This should not surprise those of us who actually spend time studying the Bible, though, because the Bible itself actually warns us in numerous places about false teachers. False teachers are not just a problem that plague the world in our day and age because the Bible records for us numerous accounts concerning false teachers from the very beginning of time. We have noticed the examples in times past for the first false teacher being, of course, the father of all lies, according to John 8, 24, who is Satan, who simply added to the word of God one word to which God had instructed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden concerning partaking of the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This, of course, is recorded for us in Genesis chapter 3. He simply added one word to that which God had said, and then sin entered into the garden and, of course, caused the fall of man. You may have noticed that I spend a great deal of my time during my sermons speaking about false teaching that is prevalent among the religious world in general, as well as that of denominational Christianity specifically. I attempt to follow in the steps of my Savior in doing this, as well as the apostles who followed after him by speaking the truth in love, according to Ephesians 4 verse 15, but of course also with plainness of speech, which Paul said he spoke with in such verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12, and of course with boldness, Acts 4, 29 and verse 34 or 31 as well, and 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 4. This being so, I must also deal with certain misunderstandings even among some of our own brethren from time to time regarding the religious world's influence in certain spiritual matters. So for the remainder of the lesson this morning, I want to share with you a lesson from the Word of God concerning something the Bible has to say about the subject of angels. This is something we hear about from time to time, and this is something that we've studied about in times past, and something I still continue even today to see many of our own brethren make posts on Facebook concerning angels and the work of angels in our daily lives today. And this, of course, leads me to believe when I see such posts as this, that many of our own brethren have a misunderstanding or have let the world's uh, information on angels maybe uh, influence their own way of thinking along these lines on the subject. So you may think that the religious world in general has a fairly similar view regarding the subject of angels. And though that may not be very far from the truth, what we shall hopefully discover during our study this morning is that the world's understanding about angels vary quite differently from the actual Word of God and what we read about angels within the Word of God. Of course, since angels are spiritual beings, the only place that we can go and find reliable truths concerning angels would be the Word of God. We can't go to Hollywood and expect them to know about the work of angels and the beginning and what the you know what we can learn about the subject of angels since the angels are not actually uh, movie topics. They're spiritual topics. But of course the movie world and Hollywood has told us most of what people come to understand about the world of angels. In fact, much of the confusion regarding angels can be attributed to the entertainment world, considering how many movie and television programs have been greatly distorted on this topic. Of course, we're familiar with such angel-related movies as the Christmas favorite, A Miracle on 34th Street, or the Disney favorite, Angels in the Outfield, 
Some might also recall an actor by the name of John Travolta who played an angel in the movie called Michael back around 1996. And in that movie, John Travolta portrayed this Michael, of course, the archangel, is who he was uh, supposedly uh, portraying in that movie. And in that particular movie, that angel drank, he smoked, he danced. He did a lot of other things inside that movie that the Bible condemns, even for individuals to take part in as individual Christians. And yet, in those movies, they have angels, spiritual beings doing such things. Not as popular, maybe, was the role that actor Nicolas Cage played in 1998 as an angel that falls in love with a human woman, played by actress Meg Ryan in the movie City of Angels. And, of course, most of us will remember several popular television programs that concern the topic of angels, like Touched by an Angel, and also a program called Highway to Heaven that stayed on television for quite a long time. There's even a movie that's out right now, and I cannot recall the name of it, but it is about the end of time, and it concerns Satan and uh, the uh, and an angel, a good angel, and they're fighting or really working together uh, concerning the end of time. And it's where they have some kind of uh, relationship with one another that's very strange, even for uh, the Hollywood people to come up with, but. Uh, angels are still a very top uh, popular topic in the world today, and that mainly is because most people don't go to the Word of God to get their understanding of what angels uh, really consist of and the true information that we can learn about angels. In fact, were it not for the Bible, how much would the world really actually know even about the topic of angels in the first place? Granted, secular history may be filled with references to angels, but from where do you think they probably got their references to angels in the first place? Well, of course, it is the Word of God, spiritual, spiritual, uh, spiritually speaking, about angels. And so they take in a topic that they think the Bible doesn't say very much about, or that doesn't say exactly enough about in their minds, they take in this and look at it as being a subject that they can expand upon and uh, try to uh, influence the world's thinking on this. And This is really what they've done. But when we let the Bible speak to us, it actually tells us the origin of angels, how and when they came into existence. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So we have noticed before the word God, as it appears in the English translation of Hebrew scripture, comes from the Hebrew word Elohim, which Strong's Hebrew and Greek dictionary tells us is plural in form and meaning, and it means more than one. So the word God there means all of the Godhead took part in the creating of the heavens and the earth. This tells us that not only was God the Father active in the creation of the heavens uh, in the heavens and the earth, but also the Holy Spirit and also Jesus Christ, or Christ, the Son of God. And so, some people like the so-called Jehovah's Witnesses and those in the Oneness Pentecostal group would have us to believe that there is only one person in the Godhead, but this alone tells us that there are more than one because it is plural. But we can know for sure that there were others because in Genesis 1 verse 26, this same God, Elohim, said, let us make man in our image. So it again is talking in plurality, meaning that there was more than one involved. Was God the Father speaking to himself on this occasion? Well, of course he wasn't. He was speaking to the other two persons of the Godhead a word that we read in the New Testament that comes from the Greek word theolotes, a word commonly referred to in the religious world as the Trinity, and a word used to refer to the three persons of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Mentioned in the creation where it says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the earth, and uh, face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. 
when we look at Colossians 1, 16 through 19, we read this about Christ's role in the creation. It says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And so Christ would have been he who created the angels. When did this take place? Well, the Bible answers that question as well. In Job chapter 28, verses 4 through 7, we learn that the angels known there as the sons of God, shouted for joy when the foundations of the earth were laid, letting us know that angels were created prior to the creation of the earth on which we dwell. Concerning the origin of angels, please realize that a common misconception about angels is that human beings somehow become angels when they die. And that is simply not what the Bible says. It is not that, but that is what, of course, the world would have us to believe because that's what we often see in movies and that's what we even see in cartoons. All of us are probably familiar with the Saturday morning cartoon where Sylvester the cat is about to lose all of his nine lives and, of course, he continues on as being a cat angel. Each one of these little spirit things come up from his body as he's losing his nine lives and they're all in the form of a cat but they're all invisible little cats there's other parts of those cartoons that pretty well show the same thing and so we know that that is how even the cartoons try to portray this because that's how the world in general like to think about angels it's about when any kind of being dies, they simply turn into an angel form of that same being. But that is not what the Bible says. When we consult the scriptures rather than the vivid imagination of men, we learn who really created angels and exactly when they were created. And as far as I know, it doesn't say that any more are being created. They were created. They were to live. Uh, they were they were to live in their spiritual realms. Some of course, were cast down from the heavenly realm in which they once resided and now reside in the realm of Satan in uh, the bad part of the spiritual realm. But we know that they were created as beings that were spiritual in nature and they were created at a certain point in time. And we do know from the scriptures who was responsible for creating them. When we let the Bible speak, we can also get some kind of idea about how many angels actually exist. And it is a lot, it seems. In Deuteronomy 33, verse 2, we read, And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousand of saints. From his right hand came a fiery law for them, it is believed by some that the word saints here in this verse refers to angels that accompanied God to Mount Sinai with the giving of the first covenant, the law of Moses. Acts 7 and verse 53 speaks of this same law, which was not kept. Though it had been given, and this is a quote from Hebrews, or from Acts 7 verse 53, by the direction of angels. Hebrews 2 and verse 2 as well mentions this when it says, For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience receives a just reward. So we learn from this that there are at least 10,000 angels, but is that all? Well, of course, we know that it's not because we can recall that during Jesus' betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane, he assured Peter that he, if he should desire it, his father could provide him with more than 12 legion of angels. We read this in Matthew 26 and verse 53. The word legion is a word meaning the principal unit of a Roman army. 
and it is said to consist from at least 3,000 to 6,000 men. So this would bring our count from 36,000 to 72,000. If God could have sent at least that many angels, 12 legions of angels, to assist Christ during his trial and his torture there on in Gethsemane. But when we read the book of Revelation and the Apostle John uh, being allowed to, to look up into the throne room of God, he saw there 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels surrounding God's throne according to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 11. So we learn that to come to an exact number of just how many angels exist is something the Bible does not tell us, but it does give us these numbers that speak of angels as, as existing in quite a large number. However, many do exist, and the Bible tells us that they are broken up into what uh, has been come to be known as two different classes. And these classes that are broken down for these angel beings are two words that we're fairly familiar with. One is called seraphim and the other is cherubim. Concerning the seraphim in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 2, we read of someone else who was allowed to view or uh, have a vision of the throne room of God where he said concerning the throne, above it stood seraphim. And then he goes on to describe what the seraphim looked like. He said each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. In contrast to these, we see the cherubim described in such verses as first king in first Kings chapter eight and verse seven as having only two wings. So the seraphim have six wings, and cherubim have two wings. And if you recall by reading 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 7, it says there that the cherubim were, of course, placed at the east of the Garden of Eden with a flaming sword in order to guard the tree of life after the fall of man that we spoke about at the beginning of the lesson. Of course, the image of the cherubim was also used in the furnishing of the Old Testament worship of, uh, or concerned the fashioning of the Ark of the Covenant that we read about in First, first Kings Act, or First Kings chapter eight, verse seven, and it, they were also fashioned at the two ends of the mercy seat. We learn from Exodus chapter twenty-five and verse eighteen. So we can also see from other verses of scriptures that angels are referred to always in the masculine sense. And that is something that is completely contrary to the religious world. Most of the time, even in paintings and uh, any kind of statues that we see or any kind of uh, things in the art world or even in books and in movies, we often see angels portrayed as female. But the Bible never never speaks of angels as being female. In fact, we learn from other verses that, of course, the angels themselves are not able to marry. And so they have no reason for marriage, so there is no need for the, them to be male and female. But angels, all the, all the angels that are mentioned in the Bible are mentioned as being masculine. And so that's what we see in the Bible concerning angels. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 30 tells us about them not having any to marry. For it says, Therefore in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. Of course, talking about us after we pass on into the spiritual realm, we have no need to, for marriage at that point. And we are like the angels of God in heaven. There is no need for marriage in the spiritual realm. This along with the fact that we've already seen that angel, angels are created beings. We should know that angels have no need to reproduce because they are created. As many of them that are needed, God or Christ created the number that was needed. So there's no need for procreation. 
They have no need for male and female because they do not, they are not produced by procreation. They are created beings. And so this dispels the false teaching, of course, of the Jehovah's Witnesses concerning Genesis 6 and verse 4, where they say that a super race of half angel and half men once existed on the earth due to angels having sexual relationships with women. When we keep Genesis 6 and verse 4 in its context, we see that Moses is simply discussing what so often happens in our world even today. God's children, the sons of God, go back out into the world to get their wives of worldly women who are called there the daughters of men, which so very often corrupt the children of God And we're warned about that, not only in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. That is something that has plagued God's people for years and years. People who are spiritual in nature going back out into the world to seek their partner for life. And of course, that often corrupts their spiritual values and also that of their children. Concerning the gender of the angels, it should also be mentioned that the only angels ever mentioned by name, of course, have male names. We've already talked about Michael, the archangel, which is mentioned in Jude chapter 9. He's also called one of the chief princes, not princesses, but princes, in Daniel 10 verse 13. And then we're all familiar with Gabriel, who is said to stand in the presence of God in Luke chapter 1 and verse 19. We also see that angels, when they came to earth, that they came to earth in service to God, they appeared in the form of men. We see this in such cases as when three angels appeared to Abraham as he dwelt underneath the oak tree at Mamre, as recorded in Genesis 18, verses 1 through 5, and Genesis 19, 1 through 3. As well as when the angel of the Lord appeared to a man when he told the wife of Manoah about the birth of their son. In Judges 13, 3 through 6. You also recall that this was a young man, or there was a young man clothed in a long white robe that the women saw when they came to the tomb of Jesus, as recorded in Mark chapter 16, verse 5. John tells us in his gospel account that this was an angel in John chapter 20 and verse 12. This being said, it certainly shatters the world's image of an angel being seen as a female or a little child, neither of which is ever alluded to in the Word of God. So when we let the Bible speak, we can also get a better idea of what the true work of angels really are in the service of God. We've already seen that they were created, of course, to serve God. Though the world would have us to believe that the sole purpose of angels are to serve mankind. The word angel actually means a messenger in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so in its typical role, we see angels performing in the Bible that work of a messenger. We've already noticed this in part when angels brought the news to Abraham and to Sarah about the future birth of their child in Genesis chapter 18. They were simply delivering a message as well as when the similar message was delivered to the wife of Manoah in Judges chapter 13. The angel at Jesus' tomb also brought a message. And what a wonderful message it was indeed, for we read there in Mark 16, verses 6 and 7, that he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Go, tell the, his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Angels have also been used to help mortal men, such as when the angel helped to feed Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, as well as when angels are seen protecting Daniel in the lion's den in Daniel chapter 6, verse 22. They also assisted Hezekiah by delivering him from the Assyrians, we learn in Isaiah chapter 37 and verse 36. And of course, one was used to free the apostle Peter from prison 
in Acts chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Angels were also used during the first century soon after the birth of the church to assist in a providential, providential way to bring men to Christ. We've noticed before the word providential and the fact that it means God working through nature, not contrary to nature, which would be a miracle. Providence is when God uses natural things in a natural way to do his natural will. When a miracle is being used, he uses nature in an unnatural way or a supernatural way to accomplish his will. For instance, in Acts chapter 8, verses 25 through 28, Philip was told by an angel about the Ethiopian eunuch traveling along the road from Jerusalem to Gaza, who was reading Isaiah the prophet. It should be noted that the angel only served the purpose of bringing the message about the eunuch to Philip, but it was Philip, a mere man, who preached the message of Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch, according to Acts chapter 8, verse 35. A message which taught him something that the majority of the religious world rejects today, the necessity of baptism. For in the very next verse we read, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what hinders me from being baptized. Acts chapter 8, verse 36. Isn't it strange today that when we hear someone say or talk about preaching Jesus, that somehow that doesn't include baptism as being essential? And yet preaching Jesus in the first century, like Philip did to the Ethiopian, certainly included preaching Jesus and it included baptism in water for the remission of sin. An angel, of course, was also used in the conversion of the first Gentile convert to Christianity, Cornelius, according to Acts chapter 10 and verse 3. But it was Peter, a mere man, who was said that would come and tell him what he must do, according to Acts chapter 10 and verse 6, in order for him to be saved, according to Acts 2 verse 28. From this we also learn that Paul told the church at Rome that it is the gospel of Christ which has the power of God into salvation, not angels or the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit upon the heart of man. So, Before I close the lesson for today, let me briefly touch on a question that some have about the possibility of each human being having their own so-called guardian angel. To my knowledge, the Bible does not use the terminology guardian angel. But this was, in fact, an actual part of the Jewish belief of people, according to Acts chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. Although in such scriptures as Matthew 18 and verse 10, Jesus said, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. It seems to say that the angels are certainly concerned for the welfare of each and every child. And that is something, something that really should be frightening to anyone who is contemplating the abortion of a child. Knowing that the angels are looking on and are concerned with the welfare of that child. The Hebrew writer also tells us not to forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained strangers. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2. Of course, this could have been referring to times back in the first century and before that, when angels actually did walk on the earth from time to time doing the bidding of God. I do not believe that those kind of things happen today since the miraculous age has passed. But we know that in times past, God did use angels to deliver messages as we've seen. And this, of course, is something that we are reminded of here in these verses. When we let the Bible speak about angels, we can see that much of the world's understanding about this topic 
has been tainted by the false teaching of man, be it the religious world's understanding of it, which is often false doctrine in general, or the world's understanding of angels, being something that is mythical, something that is based upon fantasy and just the mere imaginations of men. But as it concerns the salvation of man, we have already noticed that God has provided the gospel of Jesus Christ to accomplish this great task. It is not something that angels are going to be involved in. And it is the duty of faithful Christians to carry this gospel to a lost and dying world, as commanded by Jesus Christ just prior to his ascension back into heaven, according to Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. The Bible also tells us a bit more about the work of angels concerning the final judgment of man. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31, when the Lord returns for judgment, the voice of the archangel will be heard. And when the Lord descends from heaven, all of his angels will be with him. In Matthew 13, 41 and 42, in the parable of the tares, angels are pictured as taking part in the separating of the faithful from the unfaithful, casting the wicked into a furnace of fire, Matthew 13, verses 49 and 50. Concerning God's faithful children, we read in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, but to them, or but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? And in Luke 15, verse 10, Jesus said, Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Faith in Jesus Christ comes by hearing the gospel. After we have heard the gospel, we have the choice of becoming a believer in what we have heard or rejecting that which has been brought to us. Along with this belief, we come to realize our sinful ways and hopefully have a desire to pursue a new walk of life by turning away from our past sinful life, which the Bible calls repentance. And this is why the angels rejoice over us. It's because we have decided to start living a spiritual life at that point. And all of us should rejoice when anyone makes that change in their life. We are told in Luke 13 verse 3, unless we are willing to repent, we will perish. But repentance is not the final step we take into salvation. We must also be willing to confess our faith in Jesus Christ and then take steps to get forgiveness of those past sins from which we are turning. The Bible says this takes place when we are buried in the watery grave of baptism and the likeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what the Apostle Paul explained to the church at Rome when he said in Romans 6, starting at verse 3, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also should be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, For he who has died has been freed from sin. This newness of life that occurs when our past sins are washed away is why we are said to have been born again in John 3 verse 5. Because we have at that point become as innocent as a newborn babe. Thereafter to live a faithful life in Christ for the remainder of our days here on this earth as we serve our Savior in teaching others to do the same thing. That being accomplished when we pillow our heads at night at the end of the day, should we not awaken to see the morning light of a new day, the Bible tells us that angels play another part in the life of man. But the role is only for God's faithful. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 22, we learn that the very moment a faithful child of God 
takes his last, last breath, we are then carried by angels into the realm of departed spirits to a place of paradise called Abraham's bosom to await the return of Jesus Christ for final judgment. What a wonderful thought to have that in our mind as we close our eyes at the end of another day. Can you think that thought every night as you pillow your head? If not, you must have something amiss in your life as a faithful Christian. You must not either be faithful or you must not be a Christian. Because faithful Christians should be able to pillow their heads every night with this thought in their head. What a comforting thought this is for every Christian. And this is something that we want to pass along to every person. We want every person to be able to pillow their heads in peace, regardless of the aches and pains that we face as we grow older in this life, regardless of the things that we are faced with in our daily lives and the sinful world in which we live. All of us can pillow our heads at night with such great hope if we would just take advantage of the plan of salvation that has been provided for us. If you've not done that, we pray that you would. If you have done that and have fallen back into the world, and we can be of any assistance to you at all in coming back into the fold, we pray that you'd make your needs known as we sing the invitation song.